Well, hi, everybody. I think we'll get started. My name is Karen Struthers. I'm the director of Every Child. Every Child is a national coalition uh, made up of 80 or so organisations across Australia. And we're aiming to turn up the volume on the needs and well-being of children and young people. We really want the well-being of children and young people to be a nation building priority on par with other big nation building priorities that have really built this nation. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Our aim today is really to focus on the needs of children and young people and their families with disabilities. So thank you to our speakers. I'll introduce speakers as we go through the day or through this, the morning session. Uh, first up, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are recording the session. Uh, we really encourage you to use the chat box. This is a discussion. We'll be trying things a little bit different today. Uh, we'll be uh, interviewing and offering up questions to some of our panelists to break up uh, the event so that you are actually getting an opportunity for your questions in the chat box to be heard as well. Uh, I'm coming to you from Gubby Gubby country in Southeast Queensland. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Tasha Jones. Uh, Tasha is a Camilleroy woman uh, from Moree originally, but we won't uh, hold that against her. She's now living in Queensland uh, and we welcome uh, Tasha to do an acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Karen. So Wanya, um, which means hello and welcome in Gubby Gubby language. Um, today I am on Gubby Gubby land, so in Southeast Queensland in the Moreton Bay region. Um, could I just ask that everybody put in the chat um, the land on which people are joining us from today? Um, because I can't acknowledge every, every um, country, every mob. Um, but I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognise continuing connections to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and to their cultures and to the elders past, present and emerging. Jarjums, children and young people having a positive connect connection to their identity and culture creates a meaningful pathway to better outcomes within their lives. Having these connections at an early age will support initiatives such as the Family Matters Strategy, strong communities, strong culture, and stronger children. Creating a pathway to support Closing the Gap Initiative through implementing these strategies with our workplace and community will enhance meaningful cultural outcomes for MOB. I would also like to acknowledge the past policies and practices that are impacting our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, people, and children. And also just recognise that we're, we're coming into National Reconciliation Week um, and the theme for this year is more than a word, reconciliation takes action. And also um, on Thursday the 27th of May we have um, National Sorry Day and this day is in remembrance of the stolen generation and we remember and we acknowledge. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Tasha, and we'll all be getting behind you on Sorry Day and uh, congratulations on all the great work on Family Matters and other campaigns that are happening nationally. Um, I just want to say a couple of more housekeeping things, and that's by way of acknowledgement of people who have made today possible. First up, I want to thank uh, Essential Media, the team at Essential Media make a lot of this happen. And my colleague Freya Whitehead has been the driving force behind this event and pulling it off. Uh, Thrive by Five, the Mindaroo Foundation, and, and Jay will be speaking to us shortly have provided funding support for this event and other related activities. Uh, the Benevolent Society, uh, the mothership, we call them the mothership of every child. They had the initiative to set up every child. Uh, they fund every child and they're a great organisation uh, to work with and to support us. And our mates at CIDA, Children, Young People, Disability Australia, great to have Sue on board today. Sue's one of the steering committee members of every child and we love having her around. So thanks, Sue. Um, my job first up is just to explain a little about, a bit about the aims and the process of the forum today. So I just want to say first up that the aim today is really to focus on the fact that uh, we have so many siloed activities across Australia for children and young people. Uh, and the focus is on crisis support rather than early prevention, early support, early years support. Uh, and it's really important that we have a much better integrated support system 
not a programmatic response in silos. So uh, the communication tool that we're working with and we've developed with a RACI, it takes six, is the aim of this forum. And that, that's to cut through uh, to the public, to our service provider friends and to decision makers so that their eyes don't glaze over when you start talking about the Eraci Nest or the AIHW ecological public health model or whatever. Uh, the Family Matters building blocks, for example, are all part of a public health model. When you say those sort of terms, guess what happens? Yes, people's eyes sort of tend to glaze over. Uh, so our aim is to really try and get information out, really, uh, I guess, to a really wide audience that for young people to do well, it takes six. It takes all those elements and that's across housing, it's education, it's beginning with the early years and making sure every child has access to early years learning and support that they need and that that support is sustained through their school lives and beyond. Uh, so really, uh, if you could go to that next slide, I just wanna show people um, these cogs, we call them, but essentially, this is developed by every child with a RACI, and we really encourage you to go to the RACI nest for a lot more of the evidence-based detail and information. It takes six is basically the catch cry, the communication tool. But we know that children and young people need all those elements, including connection to culture and a positive sense of, sense of identity, being valued, respected, loved and safe participating and having their say, all those elements are important. And today we'll be dealing with all of those elements, but we'll be having a focus on the experiences of children and young people and their families with disability. Uh, we really want to try and develop a call to action around these elements, a national wellbeing commitment, where we ask governments to consider all these elements and to make sure the responses across government agencies and through National Cabinet, bring those elements together in a much more connected way. We want an end to the silos. Uh, so we'll be asking you towards the end of the forum to consider jumping on board the Thrive by Five campaign, Every Child, uh, and also uh, supporting our call to action for this national wellbeing commitment. But first up, uh, we're over to uh, Western Australia where Maddie Heady, a young disability advocate, is going to talk to us and give us uh, essentially, you know, her story on particularly why early years support for her and support that's been sustained through her life has really helped her grow and develop. And as she says, be really resilient. So Maddie, you're a great young advocate. Over to you. Hi everyone. Hope your day is going well, your mornings going well, your afternoons going well. My name is Madison Hedy. I'm 19 years old and I live with cerebral palsy. CP is a physical disability that affects posture and movement. CP also, as you can hear, affects my mouth muscles, which is why I have delayed speech. Although growing up with a disability was really tough at times, living life with a disability is no tragedy and it can be amazing. I have always love the feeling of freedom and movement. I guess because I couldn't walk or talk until I was eight years old. I've always been a bit of a go-getter. I have been rock climbing, I've sailing, done high ropes courses, and I absolutely love to run. I like a good challenge and I enjoy pushing myself. They say you only live once, right? So why not embrace it, experience it, 
say it and feel it. Sorry, Karen, I think you're still on silent. Uh, thank you. Maddie, that was great. Thank you for that start. And as you know, this is an in-discussion event. Uh, so I'm a bit like Oprah Winfrey, and I'll ask you a couple of questions. But first up, you know that one of the uh, key areas of It Takes Six is early learning and education. Can you tell us a little bit about those early years in school for you? And as you went through school, what things made a difference for you? Being the only child in my primary school, I guess, with a disability was challenging as I wasn't being bullied, but I found that I was being left out. Soon after, though, I discovered that maybe this was because the children simply didn't know how to react. Behavior or to walking frame was or what sign language meant. They were afraid of what they didn't know. And that's okay. We all are. This is where education, community teacher awareness, MP mentors are needed. When support is given early, if young people were shown AFOs, wheelchairs, get a chance to sit in them, are exposed to adults with disabilities, it is less frightening. Having open question time in class or teachers just having a simple sign lesson. Thanks, Maddie. And uh, you know that one of the other elements of the It Takes Six, a racy wellbeing model in the nest, is about participating and being included. And you've talked a bit about that. Can you talk us through more about the importance? of being included and, and why now you've decided to really be a strong young advocate? Yes, so I was really lucky to have amazing advocates pushing boundaries and creating opportunities. But unfortunately, this isn't always the case. My family and teachers in worked closely to ensure they were doing everything possible to have true inclusion in and outside of the classroom. They introduced educational, fun, inclusive games about disabilities like we watch sporting films on athletes with disabilities. This not only helps me and my peers learn lots about each other, but it also meant that I was able to develop friendships, have more confidence, develop self-esteem and community belonging. Now, this has greatly impacted me growing up from childhood to adulthood. If young children with disabilities have the right support around them and a positive inclusive childhood, then this will not only allow their self-confidence to grow, but it also creates an inc a positive imagery of the community. 
So I guess inclusion in all areas, like coaches and sporting teams that are willing to just go that extra mile can create a more inclusive community. It's really great to hear you talk about the importance of sport as an inclusive way of getting young people involved in community. And I mentioned to you earlier that there was some good news in Queensland, where I'm from. Sporting Wheelies, one of our partners in Every Child, just got some grants to do much more inclusive sport in school. So I guess you'd be all for that? Yes. I bet you definitely. are. Definitely. Because I'm more so like, hugely dedicated to sport. So, yeah. Good on you. Look, thank you for that presentation so far. I just want you to finish up on something like a really nice memory or something that you that stands out for you as really important in your your life. Oh, that's a tricky <laughs> one. Oh, it's not meant to be You're tricky. Really testing me now, Karen. <laughs> um, I guess my favourite childhood. Memory was at my seventh birthday party. It was at Hungry Jacks, and all the kids from my class were there playing on the Hungry Jacks playground with me. Now, this may seem like such a regular event that kids go to in primary school. But looking back, for me, it was really ever the first time the kids knew how to interact and include me. Some of them even tried signing <laughs> so that I could participate in their conversations. All the mums were standing around watching us play and sign together with tears of joy in their eyes, especially mine. Mm. Then the mothers proceeded to tell my mum about how all the kids were really loving their sign language classes and how they practice every night at home just so they were able to have a full conversation with me at my birthday party. This was such a fantastic feeling to finally feel a sense of true belonging to my classmates. True inclusion is so hard to define as I guess everyone has their own idea of what it looks like for them. But for me, true inclusion is when people see you for you your strengths, your personality, your friendships, and you are able to access the community and its programs without judgment. Yeah, that's great, Maddie. You've given us some really powerful messages. You always keep it real, keep reminding us of how important it is to be including people no matter what sort of background they have, and particularly with young women like you with a disability, uh, it's great you've overcome some of those obstacles. And you're never negative. You're always positive. Whenever we talk to you, you always have this great positive outlook. So good on you. Uh, good luck with your sport and all the other stuff, the advocacy work that you're doing. I'm sure my mum won't agree sometimes, uh, but thank you. <laughs> great. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so good to hear from Maddie, a great young advocate. You'd want Maddie on your team, I'm sure. Uh, 
it's my pleasure now to introduce another person who's a Western Australian, uh, recent Western Australian, I guess, the former South Australian Premier and now the CEO of Thrive by Five, Jay Weatherall. Uh, Jay, you've been doing an amazing job with a great team of people across the country, really raising the importance of the need for every child to have access to quality, early years learning and care. Uh, it's an amazing, uh, I guess, campaign that you've run and, and will be continuing to run to raise these issues. So we know one of the It Takes Six cogs is uh, access to early learning and education. Uh, and we really look forward to hearing from you this morning. And we thank the Mindaroo Foundation and Thrive by Five for supporting the work of every child and this event today. Thanks so much, Jay. Thanks so much, Karen, and wonderful to be with you. I'm coming to you from uh, Wajak Noonga country in Perth, and uh, it's, um, it's wonderful to join so many uh, passionate and um, intelligent advocates for this really important cause. And um, Madison, what a fantastic, inspirational presentation. Um, I think whenever we hear you speak, it makes us think that really anything's possible, and it really is. We really do um, thank you for that contribution. It's a great way to start, actually. Um, it does remind me that uh, one of the first jobs I had in, in politics actually was uh, as Minister for Disability between 2004 and 2008. And it was an exciting time. It, it actually, there's a relationship between that event and, and what I'm doing now as CEO of Thrive by Five in that when I first became Minister for Disability, it was a very underfunded and unloved sector. And then the community came together and, and created a campaign, uh, a campaign of a very similar modus operandi to the one we're seeking to run for Thrive by Five. And interestingly, Essential Media, who is running this event, were, were, were really at the heart of that, uh, that work back in the NDIS campaign. And we were very proud uh, to be in South Australia, uh, the first state to to launch uh, a trial site uh, for the NDIS, which was about children. Uh, we were trialing zero to 14. Um, and, uh, and now of course, uh, NDIS is, is now an established part of the, the framework. And while there's still some challenges with it, it, it uh, it's an extraordinarily massive uh, reform. And we're hoping to replicate that uh, with uh, the, the early years reform, the, and that's what Thrive by Five is all about. It, it focuses very much on the first five years, which are just so profoundly important for everything that follows. And there's an important relationship between the work as of Thrive by Five and creating an early childhood development system for this country. And also making sure that we meet the needs of people with a disability, because so many, um, of the, the challenges in the disability sector would be improved by, by early intervention, by acting earlier to make sure that um, the developmental needs of, of children are met. And the, the truth is that every, every child's unique. I mean, anyone that's, that's been around children or had children, even in your own family, you think, um, you think you're doing much the same thing, but they all pop out very differently. And um, they're all, um, they all have their unique strengths and challenges. Um, and, and that's the, you know, that's the joy of life is, is the, is that, you know, there's no two separate people that will ever walk the planet that will be completely identical. They'll all have their own identity and, and expression. And of course our role is to make sure that that can be realized, uh, to make sure that um, difference doesn't translate into disadvantage. Uh, and, and, really at the heart of Thrive by Five is this notion of flourishing or, or thriving, to be the very best you can be, to, uh, to draw on all of your, your talents and your unique um, place in the world. And that's why it's such a powerful and exciting agenda, because it's just so full of possibility. I mean, it's impossible to look at um, little children and see the way in which they engage with the world without feeling inspired about the possibilities of the future. It's just, it, it means the cure, it's, it's the cure for uh, cynicism, it's a cure for, uh, for 
for depression, just hang around little children for long enough and just see the, the wonder and all they have if they, as they seek to, con, to make meaning and sense of the world. It's just, just one of the great joys of life. In fact, I can't imagine a better job than perpetually working with... I, I, I used to say when I was representing kindergarten teachers um, in my portfolio that it's got to be the best job in the world. You get to spend the whole of your life with four-year-olds which are, um, they're, they're sort of still babies, but they're old enough to talk and they haven't yet been sort of, the world hasn't got hold of them and told them that they've, they've got to think in different ways yet. So, I mean, these are, these are very exciting times of life and it's a great, I think it's a, it's a touch of campaign full of hope and, uh, and joy. So it's, it's been a great pleasure to, to meet so many of you, the, many of the people here that are on, the, on today's Zoom and to, to meet new people, and, and there are new people joining the campaign every day. It's not really our campaign in the sense, I mean, there's been people talking and working in this area for so many years. Karen, the Every Child organisation really arrived at the same conclusion that we arrived at um, uh, using a different route, but really, really reaching the same conclusion. And so, as Karen said, really been one of the great challenges has been the way we can build together and ensure that uh, we have many voices but one message. And the message that we're focusing on is, um, is, the, is just part of the, the It Takes Six story. It's this notion of, of learning right from the start uh, and making sure that we build a community of support around children and families uh, to ensure that, that um, they do develop in a, a healthy and, and successful way. And it's really based on the, the simple idea about the way in which uh, all of our brains develop in those first five years, where uh, we're endowed with um, all of the, all, everything that we'll never need for the rest of our life. And the question becomes whether all of those possibilities are switched on. And they're switched on through experience. So it's not, in the old days, we used to think there was some genetic determination of our, of our development. And it was largely chronological that occurred simply if you looked after children and fed them and nurtured them and uh, then they would essentially along some chronological timeline develop. We now know that's not right. What actually develops children both positively and negatively is experiences. And so the way in which they interact with the world, the way in which their, their sensory pathways are stimulated and the connections that are made between those, those, sen those sensory pathways is the thing that that builds capability, it, it builds um, uh, and, and arrests disability or creates new abilities to, to make their way around uh, 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 any, any uh, challenges that may occur. Uh, and so what that means is high quality nurturing relationships uh, in which uh, children experience uh, stimulating activities which allow their little brains to develop. Um, and there's, there's not parenting and then sort of centres and that there are choice, that these things should be seen as one continuum. There is, should just be seen as, as children at the centre of, of our practice and they get their needs met by their parents, by their caregivers, by their grandparents, uh, and crucially also by high quality early educators that are able to be the bridge between this neuroscience and the practice that occurs both in these centres and also at home. So this is, this is our vision, places that exist, just a, a pram walk away from, from every home uh, where parents, pregnant uh, mothers, but also mothers and fathers can go for the support they need to be the very best parents that they can be, but also children to get the high quality experiences that, that they need to, to grow uh, and uh, to, to thrive. So that's, that's our vision. The campaign is to bring together many voices, um, the many voices, of some of which are represented here, but we meet weekly on a Thursday. We're always after people to join us. Um, we, uh, we have a campaign uh, website called thrivebyfive.org.au, and we'd encourage as many people as possible to join that campaign. It doesn't oblige you to do anything other than just see what we're all doing and find ways of joining in if you wish. So. Um, uh, I'm so thrilled to be part of this group and um, thank you very much for having me today.
Thank you so much, Jay. And uh, we've put the Thrive by Five link in the chat box there. We really uh, encourage people to get behind Thrive by Five. And I'm really pleased, Jay, that in your campaigning work, you're really focusing as well on the quality of the workforce and, you know, in both the disability sector, in the child early learning sector, uh, the workforce really needs a decent pay rise. So I'm going to put in a plug for the workforce as well and just say, uh, like you, in my former life in politics, one of my uh, memorable moments that I recall was really supporting and being successful in getting a pay equity rise for community services workers in Queensland, which precipitated work on the national pay rise too. So important. Uh, it's important for the well-being of children and young people that workers in disability in the early learning sector are remunerated and valued. Uh, thanks again, Jay, and we look forward to working with you more on Thrive by Five. We now move to uh, more of the in-discussion format uh, and have a panel of speakers, and I'll introduce them as they uh, uh, come on to the panel. Uh, so first up, we have Sue Tate. Sue is an advocate at the Children and Young People with Disability Australia, CIDA. And CIDA are a member of Every Child and on our steering group. And again, Sue is a powerful advocate. She's certainly one of those people you'd want on your team. Uh, Sue, you've been an advocate both because of your own experience, but also you know, what you see around you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in advocacy and share some of the experiences with your daughter, Eliza? Thanks, Certainly. Sue. Thank you, Karen. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge um, young people with disability who have been advocating for inclusion and the self-advocates who've put so much of themselves and their lives forward over the years. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the children and the young people with disability and their families who are looking for us um, to lead the way and to create new um, pathways for them. Um, I was reflecting the other day on my kindy experience um, and remembering being the only child who didn't sleep at nap time at kindy. Um, and both my children have continued in that strong tradition um, and things like paint and paintings on the fridge are also a strong memory. And Eliza is our youngest child in our family and we wanted her to have the same kindy experience as her brother. Um, so that was really important to us as a family and they did attend the same kindy and had very similar experiences, the same amount of sand to tip out of shoes at the end of the day, the same <laughs> amount of paint on faces and in hair and the same amount of Play-Doh that was eaten, I think. Um, but this, for Eliza, for our youngest child, this did take some work, um, both advocacy and also collaboration with the centre. Um, Eliza was always physically included at um, kindy um, but the social and the curriculum inclusion was the thing that really needed focus and um, learning for both um, myself and also for the workers there as well. Uh, thanks. Yeah, we'll come back to you as well in, in our true in discussion panel style. We'll have more questions for you. I just want to introduce each of our panellists and give them a bit of an intro. Uh, next up is Karina Enks. Karina manages uh, the Early Childhood Early Intervention uh, Program uh, that TBS, the Benevolent Society, run in Queensland and is a partner with the NDIS. Uh, Karina, you've done a lot of work to bring people together to support young people, children in those early years. Can you tell us a bit about, you know, if you reflect, I guess, like Sue did, uh, you know, what's happened in the past, what you, you've been aware of, and what's happening for kids now, keeping in mind that it takes six sort of well-being model? Yes, I think, uh, so hello, yes, I am Karina and I am sitting on Gimoy Wallabari in Dingy country today up in Cairns. Um, and I do look after our early childhood, early intervention programs at the Benevolent Society. Um, look, I think uh, reflecting on what everybody has been speaking about, I guess sort of Maddie took me on a journey back to my early days in little athletics where I felt a little bit um, like the slowest person on the field and like I, I didn't fit fit the mould of an athlete but every Friday my dad would run me down to the track and, and it was you know the highlight of my week being a part of the community and being there outside of school with sort of everybody from the small country town that I grew up with grew up in and I guess that's what 
sort of we've been advocating for in the work that I've been doing is really making sure that all of our families and all of our children have those opportunities to be able to participate in that way and, and be able to be in some of those, you know, in small country towns, it is those sporting events that, that are really, really integral to being a part of the bigger community and being a part of something bigger. So, you know, we always work with our, our families to, to look at, you know, how can we include a social goal? Or how can we work to in, including that that bigger picture out into the community because I know you know how important it is it, even if you're not the fastest runner on the field or, or throw the javelin the furthest oh my goodness my javelin attempts were always terrible <laughs> um, but just being able to be there and being a part of that bigger community and being part of something larger than just school. Great thank you. Uh, next up are the dynamic duo that I referred to earlier and we met Tasha Jones when she did the acknowledgement to country but welcome back, Tasha. Uh, you're in a great role. You're the Aboriginal Senior Practitioner in Community Engagement with the Medevlin Society in the ECEI program that Karina manages. Uh, and your dynamic partner there is Sarah Delamos, a strong advocate for community engagement and creating culturally safe and appropriate pathways for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. Uh, you're both, uh, well, Sarah, through her role at the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health and your role at TBS, um, you have really clicked together there and got a great <laughs> partnership. So that's great. That's why you're the dynamic duo. And I must say an award winner. I thought you'd have your trophy up there behind you, Tasha, for the Best Life Award that you won recently. Um, do you want to share some memories as well? I, I guess that's the theme this morning is, is how have things been in the past how can we make things different for kids so that all those six elements of well-being are there in their lives? Who wants to kick off? Sarah's looking at me. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I guess um, I, growing up with um, my brother had an acquired brain injury from an accident of a very young age and living in a country town, um, you know, a small town with not many supports, I felt like I was the detective. Um, I felt like that I was always watching and keeping eyes on what he was doing, where he was going, who he was with, if he was going to be hurt, um, that sort of thing. And I guess there was no support sort of in place for that. You know, there was no supports apart from, you know, family. I, there was nothing around to support how I guess I was feeling being that detective. I do call myself a detective because I was. <laughs> I watched every move he made um, because I was so fearful that he would be hurt. Um, and I think um, as time has gone on, community support has really grown. Um, and there is so much more out there to support families um, in all different aspects. You know, there is that early intervention, which, you know, um, my brother wasn't able to receive in a small country town. Um, that's all out there now, you know, to support him on his pathway. But there's also so many supports in place now for families um, that are on that journey and maybe going through that 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 grief and loss period um, and those types of things. And I think that's what really draws me to community is that um, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of what's going on in community and connecting people to the right supports and services and you know, not them not having to relive or retell their story. I think that's really important, particularly that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, communities. Great. Hi, um, my name's Sarah Delemo, so I work alongside Tash. Um, my memories, my early memories would be, it's a bit mixed. So we relied a lot on family. So my mum would mm. care for us <clears throat> and our extended family, so grandma. Um, that's kind of my memories but my son was put into daycare and I guess he really had that um, holistic approach mm -hmm. he's also got a couple of extra challenges in his life and I guess that's where we as a family learnt about inclusiveness and how to best support him and give him a really good I don't know, like supports in his early life and prepare him for school and what's to come. Great. Uh, thank you. I might just put a question uh, back to Sue first up to open up the panel discussion. Um, Sue, do you think we're getting better at responding to the six areas of well-being and making sure services are better integrated? 
And maybe I'll ask the others to think about that as well. Back to you, Sue. Um, I'm a natural cynic, so my first instinct <laughs> is to say no, but um, I think we're getting better at talking about the challenges. Um, and I think we're getting better as um, an organisation and um, also as a, as a cluster of organisations to actually come together and talk about what the challenges are. So recognising that things like Every Child and Thrive by Five are campaigns out there now um, and that CIDA has been able to be a part of those two very important pieces of work um, and that organisations are open to um, the feedback um, and us raising concerns, you know, talking about um, the needs of children with disability. I think that is encouraging. Um, it's obviously um, work that needs to happen across many areas. Um, so, you know, CIDA puts a huge amount of energy into um, being that combined voice for children and young people um, and supporting young people to become um, the voices of young leaders um, and talking to different uh, organisations, whether it be government um, or um, community run organisations. Um, but we still have a fair way to go to elevate and centre the voice of young people in our organisations. Um, so that's a challenge I would issue to everybody today. Um, so CIDA has done a lot of work obviously in this space over the last couple of years and, and previously as well, and came together with our National Youth Disability Summit last year. And we are in the midst at the moment of um, recruiting for our youth executive and also for the co-design committee for this year's summit. Um, but those things are integral to our success of advocating on young people's behalf and with young people um, and being able to talk about uh, the voice of young people. So I think we, ha we have a fair way to go, but um, I feel like there are more opportunities for young people to be at the table. Um, and while co-design is a little bit of a buzzword at the moment, um, we are seeing more and more authentic co-design um, but it will always take um, us to challenge whether that's real and how it actually plays out in the outcomes and the solutions that come forward so a bit of work to do sorry yeah no, a good healthy cynicism is fine <laughs> all good um, I just wanted to pick up on the young leaders and the advocacy work that you and others are doing but I might um, just push pause on that for a sec because it's a really important thing and obviously a critical element of the wellbeing frameworks, including the communication we're doing with It Takes Six, um, and genuine, you know, real, not tokenistic input is so important. So let's press pause on that and come back to that. But if I can just go to Karina and ask the same sort of question to Karina. Um, Karina, could you talk a bit more about the work that you're doing? Uh, and also, you know, I guess that question of do you think the systems are improving and the systems are working better together across those six areas. I will try and not have my healthy cynicism hat on, but it oh. is there, there a little bit as well. But I guess, you know, I, I do see a really positive future for the work in this space because the conversations are happening. I guess um, one of the things that we do at the Benevolent Society is the, the Partner in the Community Program for Early Childhood Early Intervention. But having that embedded in a um, not-for-profit, not, non-government organisation has been really integral for us to be able to do some of those wraparound supports. So we know a family doesn't come to us with just one need. There's quite often many different things that are presenting for that family. And sometimes an NDIS funded plan is the very last thing that that family would need in, in terms of supports and in terms of, you know, being able to raise a healthy child or, or that child that thrives by five. I think luck you know for us at the benevolent society we do have a raft of programs that we can connect families in with from that very first sort of point of intake um, and I guess um, what the part of the work that I'm sure Tasha and Sarah will talk about um, is being able to connect families in with those broader um, organizations and supports that are out there as well and just recognizing really early that you know there are many different answers to the same question and it is really working with each individual family to recognise, well, well, what is the correct pathway and how can we support in this space? Um, the way we work at 
the Benevolent Society as that partner in the community. We really have um, some community development workers. So Tasha is one of our community development workers, but and, and Sarah also joins her out on a lot of those visits as well. But really being out there alongside some of these new ventures that are popping up and, and new places that are popping up where we are seeing some of that um, voice of the child and some of that co-design happening it's very very new um, but you know our, our community development workers are out there alongside those organizations trying to support and also trying to link families in so they can be part of that process and part of the design because we know there's not a one-size-fits-all model but the, the more sort of different programs and different elements of design that are able to be included in some of those programs I think is really really important so I guess I, I do have some rose colored glasses sometimes as well you know I do see that as a really big positive for the for the future but as Sue said there's a lot of work to be done um, we, we need to move past that conversation phase and really put some of these things into action now and, and see them rolling out for our families and our little ones great thanks Karina uh, the dynamic duo Tasha and Sarah if I can ask you in responding to that question of do you think things are getting better and that the you know the six elements are being better connected up uh, do you think that's happening early enough too in the early years uh, mm. can I can I ask you to ponder on that one I guess um, for Sarah and I we do um, we are out and about in community a lot and we are in communities such as like we will go into caravan parks, we go into Aboriginal play group, um, you know, we're going into places where there's some really vulnerable families and vulnerable children. So I guess there is a lot of work to be done because purely like Karina said before, you can't actually, you know, an NDIS funded plan for a child with a developmental delay is not going to fix all their problems. Um, so it's really about working in collaboration with a lot of organisations and that is why the partnership with IUE is absolutely amazing and the first of its kind is that they have so many services that are available to these families, such as, you know. Family law team, yeah. these teams, medical um, clinicians. Social health, um, allied health professionals, paediatricians. You know, we could keep going on yeah. and on and on. But it by working in collaboration with each other, we've really been able to support and link these families into some services that have really been meaningful to them um, because it, I guess it's like a one-stop shop sort of thing in the sense that we're not linking them into services all over you know, the region. They're actually going to one place. And then Sarah and I can, can follow up with that family once we put some supports in place for them and then go down that pathway um, of NDIS and what what pathway may you know fit their needs. Um, Ensuring they're supported yeah. from every angle. And, and and in particular in a culturally safe way. Good. So that's that's the most important part. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, given the in discussion style, uh, we're really encouraging people to put questions in the chat box and our support team will raise those questions uh, for me to ask. Um, so please be using that chat box opportunity. Um, I'm not sure, we have a question there around the co-design issue. And, um, you know, I think it's to Sue, you know, what would good co-design really look like with young people and, and an opportunity for young people to have their say in co-design as well. Sue, did you want to, um, so, respond I mean, to that question. Actually, oh, sorry, I think um, I've missed the, the the person who asked the question, V Wilson. We're going to do something clever here, Sue. I jumped the gun. I got out of the blocks too early. V is actually going to come on. He's uh, unmuted, and uh, away you go, V. Thank you. Good morning. So, where are you coming from, V? You you look um, tropical north there. Well, my photo is Mauritius from 2019. Oh, stop it, stop it. When, but see, it's a bit cloudy. I did get chill blains because I have a, okay. I, that's part of my disability. But um, I'm on Wajak Noongar land. Um, so I'm in Rockingham over in WA. Great. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for this opportunity. So I was an early years educator and had to step out due to disability within the household and I've 
now do a lot of work within community mental health and lived experience um, advocating for my adult children. Um, when I had to step out of early years, I was a bit burnt out, to be honest, because I kept trying to find ways that we were bringing the voices of, of the children themselves and it wasn't working out. Um, so I had two questions. One was what what authentic co-design means to Sue and, and how you differentiate that from tokenistic efforts, which is what I see a lot in community mental health, um, because it is the buzzword, it's co-pro and it's co-design. Um, but if we invite people to participate, we have to actually do stuff with that. Um, and whether people are seeing that actually happen on the ground with young people, not only their parents or carers. So if we're talking young children, are we seeing their voices from them? Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Um, so I think one of the challenges in um, gathering the voice of, of young children in particular is obviously access to them, so appropriate access, um, and also being able to get a appropriate mix of place, family structures, cultural background, um, et cetera. And the people that we've seen be most successful in that is actually the child commissioners. So each state, state and territory has a child commissioner. Now, I don't know whether it's their title alone, but they seem very good at doing those pieces of work and bringing forward um, the voice of children. Sometimes it's through art, sometimes it's through um, storytelling and sometimes it's about sort of data collection as well um, and unfortunately because of the siloed system you might often see the voice of children say who are in the hospital system so I know that the Queensland Children's Hospital up here is very good at getting um, young people via Juice TV to talk about um, their experiences and that's been a great initiative up here and then similarly um, various education departments across the country also gather student voice um, but it has the challenge of those surveys are done in the classroom potentially with the teacher right here um, so you know there would all be obvious concerns about how authentic that is so there's a big variety um, and I think um, we need to think about how we access children in that way and do it in a way that also doesn't um, create disturbance or trauma for themselves, um, but gathers authentic messages. Um, and I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, and I think it's one of those ones that you need to cut across systems so that you get um, a true demographic spread of um, children's voice. Thanks, Karen. Sorry, that's great, Sue. And I might just throw to our other panellists to see if anyone else wants to add to that. Our dynamic duo, how are you going over there? Do you want to add to that? No, sorry, we had some technical issues and the camera was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're with us. Did, uh, did you want to add anything to what Sue said in response to V's question? No, we didn't actually hear the whole complete because we had some technical. No worries. Okay. I'm really, really sorry. I do apologise. That's great. Uh, we'll cut to Karina and just give Karina the opportunity to add anything to that and then we'll move to another question. Karina. Look, <laughs> thank you. And thanks, V. Look, I really do think that you've hit the nail on the head there. It is really, really difficult to get that authentic input from our little ones, particularly, as Sue said, across those different areas. Um, I know that at the Benevolent Society, we do have access to young children and, um, you know, we work, we have a long day care centre or an early childhood education and care centre at Acacia Ridge and up here in Cairns, we have a kindergarten. And certainly the way we include children's voice in designing each of those programs um, is through those stories and pictures and really working um, alongside the children to be heard in a way that they feel um, comfortable with um, and, and some some children don't want to be involved in some of those conversations and that's okay but 
it's really amazing when given the opportunity, um, how quickly those children will come forward and, and design something totally new in terms of what we're doing in the kindergarten. I was very lucky to be quite involved in the kindergarten up here in Cairns. And, and it, it looks really different to a lot of the other kindergartens because of that. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's not happening everywhere. Um, and I certainly note that once you do get something that looks a little bit different, um, how it's then really difficult to keep it in that inclusive space. I think, you know, the kindergarten in Cairns, they, they had an occupational therapist and a speech pathologist coming in and working alongside the educators and the children. And we had a really lovely mix of families and our um, child and family practitioners were working alongside some of the families there in the kindergarten as well. But what very quickly happened is word got out about all of the amazing work that was happening. And uh, a lot of those families who did have children with um, extra needs or there was specific vulnerabilities that were happening in the family were selecting that kindergarten and mm -hmm. we wanted it to be a model for everybody um, but what, what happened is it it became the model that you know everybody came to so I think you know there are some really nice examples out there like that where um, there is that beautiful integrated approach that's been supported in design by the children in the in the space mm -hmm. but yes it, it is hard to then have that replicated elsewhere um, and, and not become the the one beacon where all families come and you know I, I see that across Brisbane as well you know we have some really great early childhood education and care settings that do a really great job of that but then you know it, it will be one and then all families flock to that one particular early childhood education and care setting so there's got to be a way of sharing that information across and supporting all centres to be inclusive and really wrap around families in that inclusive way so yeah like I said I have right. rose-coloured glasses there's great examples but there is work to be done. <laughs> right. Thanks, Karina. It is great work and good on you and your teams across Queensland. Um, Tasha and Sarah, I'm going to come back to you now that you don't have your tech issues. And <laughs> if you could pick up on what Karina was saying about the need to work across those allied health areas so that, you know, again, going back to the It Takes Six wellbeing areas, obviously emotional health, mental health, uh, good physical health are all very important. And I heard Sarah say that IUI has such a really good range of support services, allied health services. Uh, can you talk a bit more about your partnership and how you're able to work to wrap around more of those supports for children and their families? Maybe we can give an example of families that we have worked with together. Um, I guess they came through so I, they were referred to us through IUE and we were able to work together and um, meet with a, with a grandma yeah. who was caring for a little girl since birth. So we, we, um, we yeah, she had a yeah, grand, granddaughter from the age of three months. Yeah. Yeah. So upon, you know, our visit to her, we realised there were, the NDIS was their, I guess their current concern, but yeah. Through discussions, we realised that there were schooling issues, um, mental health mental issues health. and fatigue for the, the carers. Um, there was lots going on for this yeah. family and I guess they're in, they're, their concerns of being able to continue to care for their mm -hmm. granddaughter as she grew older with um, her developmental concerns. So um, I, the, the beauty of the partnership was that they came through IUE and they were linked with the paediatrician, they were linked with allied health professionals through IUE, which is a free service. Um, and that service is for any, any child that identifies as Aboriginal or their siblings. So their siblings don't actually have to identify to be able to go through that service as well. It can be family of. It can be family of. Um, and it's as simple as going to your GP and having that discussion and the GP yeah. actioning those referrals to the appropriate areas yeah and you know we'll, we were able to support grandma um, through getting access to NDIS and getting some supports put in place to help her um, care and care for her her granddaughter and moving forward that that was all well and good but there was also lots going on for grandma you know school exclusion um, she was being excluded from school um, she had to be picked up at 12 o'clock every day and then before our meeting, Grandma had disclosed to us that she'd received a letter from the school that if her little one's um, emotional development didn't improve. didn't improve, that she wouldn't be welcome at the school. 
So we were then able to bring in other supports for grandma. So we sent her to another indigenous organization by the name of Kabingo, where they are able to go in and advocate with grandma. Um, they were taken elder in and support grandma through that process of that exclusion. And, and in grandma's eyes, she was led to believe that that was okay. Mm. It was okay that she had to pick her up at, at 12 o'clock every day, that, that the school was actually helping her out. So we had those discussions around how, um, you know, inclusion at school is actually a responsibility. You know, the school should be building the capacity of the, the teachers to be able to support this little one through what was going on. Um, so it, it, overall, it was an amazing outcome because we worked together as a team and connected as two different organisations, but put so much support in for grandma that she's actually feeling so positive now. Um, that she can actually continue to care for her young granddaughter. So that's a great outcome. You could just see your own dynamic on screen. You two get along <laughs> so well, and that is reflected in your service delivery. So no wonder you're an award-winning duo. <laughs> um, you did mention though about those issues the grandmother in that family had around inclusive education. Mary Sayers, the CEO from Children, Young People, Disability Australia has asked a question in the chat box. So I'm going to cut to Mary. Mary, you're doing great work, particularly around the Royal Commission. I know you're flat out and it's so wonderful to see your beaming face. Take Thank it away. You <laughs> Thank you very much, Karen. And I feel like a bit of an imposter um, on this um, screen um, with so much expertise um, around the table. And um, we are delighted to be partnering with you on this webinar. My question was less for Sue and for the other panellists, um, because Sue, no, Sue, I know Sue's answers, um, given she works for us. What, to what extent do you think early childhood educators understand the benefits of inclusive education, um, particularly as they're considering that transition to um, school? And so in my view, early childhood educators have a really important role in promoting a really strong transition to school. Yet we hear that many um, NDIS providers as well as um, early childhood educators actually recommend segregated education for students with disability, despite the fact that we know the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability um, says inclusive education, you know, that children have a right to inclusive education and over 40 years of research that this leads to better outcomes. So I guess Karina and Tasha and team, to, to what extent do you think that early childhood educators really understand the benefits of full inclusion, particularly in that transition to school and how they promote those messages to families? Am I, am I putting you on the spot, Karina, to go to you first? No, you're going to put on me you? on my soapbox. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so as an early childhood teacher by background um, with uh, my master's in special education as well. Look, it is a real passion area of mine. And Mary, I guess this is the area that, you know, when Tasha can, will probably jump in and talk about the work that we've been doing out alongside our ECEC. So we do information sessions with them, I think almost on a weekly basis, and they're really well attended. So we have lots of those early childhood education and care directors, teachers, um, group facilitators coming along to those sessions and hearing about ECEI, what is best practice, what inclusion means, and how to actually create some of those inclus inclusive spaces for young children. Um, interestingly, they continue to be well attended. And I guess the feedback from a lot of those centres that we're working with is that there is just really, really significant turnover in the early childhood sector. Um, I totally agree that it is sort of under-recognised in a monetary sense, but also in, in, in a sense that it's probably one of the occupations that's not um, upheld as it should be as shaping our young children and shaping our country's future. Um, certainly, I know that there is a want by a lot of uh, the centres that we've been working with to create those more inclusive environments and absolutely support children to go through and attend, you know, mainstream school settings. But sometimes, you know, if it's not um, funded and if it's not held as the highest um, sort of... Uh, in the highest regard by the entire community, it's really hard sometimes for those settings to prioritise that. 
Um, not that I'm saying that's right, but there is certainly something that we need to do to continue those conversations and continue to support, you know, what that best practice is out and about in our um, early childhood settings. But as you say, then going through to schools as well, um, there's something to be said by our systems all being, I think siloed was the word Sue used, um, but you know, when we're looking to support that transition from early childhood education and care across into school, um, that's another area that sometimes there just isn't enough happening. Um, I know Tasha and Katie, who is our other child development, oh, sorry, community development worker, work really closely with the transition officers from Education Queensland that support that trans transition to school. But when, when we're talking little ones with disabilities, um, it certainly needs to be much more. And, you know, certainly even the, the first 10 weeks of school needs to be really well supported, not just in that transition, you know, point between the early childhood education and care setting and the school setting. So certainly more that we all need to do, um, but I, I do feel like there is a bigger picture issue there in our early childhood education and care settings where you know it, it is really hard for those settings to keep good staff and keep their staff upskilled in in what they're trying to skill up on and understand all of the different ways that they can get supports into those settings um, from you know their inclusion support agencies but also from NDIA and also from some of the Education Queensland supports that are out there and available as well so I think bringing those silos together, so bringing the wheels together to work around those um, children and to support those centres to be able to access all of the different um, sort of uh, programs that are available to them and understand those is a big piece of work. And I, I probably would like to throw to Tasha, but that's Karen's job, <laughs> to, talk a, <laughs> to talk a little bit about what's happening in terms of um, working alongside some of those ECECs and trying to connect the dots in terms of best practice and working in that space. Great. I will throw to Tasha and Sarah in a sec. I just wanted to say, Mary, you've got a friend on your soapbox. Karina's <laughs> going to stand <laughs> alongside you there. Um, I also just want to give another plug for questions in the chat box. Please put your questions in the chat box and we'll try to get as to as many of those as we can. And also to use the chat box to give us some feedback both feedback on the presentations, feedback on what steps we can do next as well. Okay, Tasha and Sarah, Karina, through to you. <laughs> yeah, so um, what Karina was talking about, my colleague Katie um, and myself, we're both in that community development role. We have for the past 12 months um, been doing those um, information sessions with ECECs, um, education play groups, we're just about to start on primary schools. Um, and that's been ongoing. Um, and as Karina said, the request has not slowed down. So we actually completed all of the EC, ECs across our region and they've asked for more. So we're just continuing them on. Um, and that information sessions is, you know, around the ECEI, um, what it entails, what it looks like and how they can support and be champions in that space. Hmm. So it's, um, it's been really successful. Um, and Katie and I do sit in on meetings with um, education um, and they want to know about the exclusions that are happening. Um, so we are reporting that when we're meeting with families, um, all of our child development specialists are aware to, to pass that information on to us and we will take that to the department because they do want to know, they want to know what's going on because, um, you know, there has been a lot of rates of exclusion, I guess, in school. Um, and around that transition um, to school, you know, it is so important, and especially for a child with special needs or a developmental concern or a disability, um, to have that in place to make that transition smoother and, you know, have a better outcome for, for young people. Um, it is really important. And I guess if a child is on a, a, an NDIS funded plan, you know, we can put that transition to school support in there to support the therapist to, you know, trans transition them over to a new setting, you know, because that we all know that can be really, really scary um, and not, you know, such smooth sailing for a child that that may have special needs. So mm. it is it is very important. Um, yeah. Great. Sarah, did you want to add to that? No, I've actually attended this information session and I've watched Tasha and Katie in action and it, it's quite informative and it's it explains, you know, what 
the NDIS can be responsible for and what some things they don't cover. Yeah. So I think it's yeah definitely worth. Um, while I've got you both there, then can I ask about? You know, given the great partnership you have and the capacity then to work across many of those six areas of well-being, what tips do you have for others at a local or regional level to work better together? Like what's the magic ingredients for you and what can you give as tips to others? I guess um, for Sarah and I, <clears throat> it's really about that cultural pathway and about that being um, appropriate for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. We really want to break down those barriers that, sorry, someone's banging in the background. Um, we really want to break down those barriers of engagement. We know that they're un underrepresented um, in many areas. It's not just the NDIS, there's in many areas. So we want to make it culturally safe pathway for them to access supports. Um, whilst also trying to, you know, provide as much education and yeah. like knowledge that we have and pass it on so that it can empower these families to also yeah. you know, advocate for themselves. Yeah. And it's all relationships. And it is, it's all about relationships and it's all about changing, um, changing the way we do things, yeah. simplifying it. You know, it's just a yarn. We're just going in for a yarn. We're not, you know, we do we know that there's that fear of engagement, um, you know, because of those past policies and practices and we don't want them to have that fear. So it is with Sarah and I, it's about going in and having a yarn. Um, we've even had some meetings where we've had a laugh yeah. um, <laughs> when we're talking about children with a disability. So, you know, um, we want the, the families to feel comfortable and to most importantly feel safe. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, Sue, did you want to add to that? You know, what tips do you have? What are the magic ingredients in partnerships locally and regionally, I guess? Yeah. And one of the things I think to recognise is that individual advocacy support for um, families to help transition to school is one of the really underfunded areas across states and territories. So, um, you know, there's kind of an assumption in some of the systems that every parent can advocate for their child with disability, and that is not necessarily the case. So it's one of the areas where there is a big gap, but something that was really important to us as a family. So Eliza is our second child. Child. Um, and so we, our son was attending the local school was to make sure that we kept the excitement. So while there was lots of planning, there was lots of conversations, lots of behind the scenes work, um, making sure that school was ready for Eliza. We also made sure we kept that excitement the same as we had for our son of, you know, we're transitioning from kindy to school. It's about getting the uniform. It's about, you know, what are we going to have for lunch and keeping those natural things that are about starting school as being the important stuff for her. Um, so that she felt and had very similar experiences to her brother. And I think that's something that's quite hard um, as a family when you're dealing with those exclusions and that gatekeeping and, you know, questions about can your child do this yet? Can your child do that yet? And um, lots of questions about, um, you know, how your child will be supported and will your child be, be ready for school? Um, we, we like to encourage people to think about how the school could be ready for the child. And um, if you look at some of the lists of things that um, pop up in social media about the same time every year about being school ready, um, my child who's in year three and having a fantastic experience at her local school, um, she may never tick some of those boxes as being school ready, but she is a valued student in her local community. Um, so I suppose I'd encourage both the early childhood services as well as um, people supporting families to not to forget the fun stuff about starting school um, and the excitement as well. Great, really good point. Um, Karina, did you wanna add anything to that? Look, I really love that schools being ready for our children. I think, you know, I, I went through the era of teaching when we were getting children ready for school. You know, I, I was an early childhood teacher back then. And, and it was really disheartening for some of the families who felt like, oh, gosh, you know, of all of those boxes on the screen, I can maybe tick two. 
but you know it certainly is shifting and some of those um, early childhood um, transition officers that are working in Queensland at the moment between schools and um, the early childhood education care settings are working with those schools with exactly that that tool saying you know is your school ready is the school ready to accept these children and work with these children that's what we want to see across the whole community um, it's not about you know uh, us working with children to try and make them fit what's happening out and about in the community. It is making sure that communities are safe and welcoming and open for our little ones. Um, we, we want all of our children to have the experience that you know we each had as children or, or didn't have. We missed out on some of us in growing up and, and we want to make sure that that's continued you know, across the lifespan. I, I think um, it, like like we said, it is improving. We're having these conversations, but it needs to continue. And we need to think of our community as a place that is inclusive for all of our children and, and really work on ways to be able to do that in a way that isn't just, you know, ticking a box. It is really being there and, and working alongside the community to, to grow these spaces and grow these programs around children. I, I love that, Sue, you know, the school being ready for the child. It's the same, it's the community being ready for the child and making sure um, that we, we do meet the children and the family where they are rather than, you know, putting seven hoops that people need to jump through to get there. Right. Uh, we've talked about connections and better integrating services and supports at a local and regional level. Natalie King has put a question in the chat box and I might ask Natalie to introduce herself and raise her question because she's uh, turning up the volume. She's put an issue there about uh, government and non-government services, I think, working better together. Natalie, are you online there ready to roll with your question? Yes, I am. Thank you, Karen. Welcome. You're, yeah, Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I'm actually on Yugen Bear land on the Gold Coast here in Queensland. Thank you very much. Everyone's discussions are truly inspiring. And I guess that's what leads me to my question is the fact that we're all working for the same purpose. So across your collective experiences, where do you see that government and non-government can actually work together? I work with Gold Coast Health, so I work across the health sector. But where do you see that we can collectively work together? And from your experience, where has it worked and why did it work? Because I think those learnings can be invaluable as we sort of continue these conversations that turn them into action. Thanks, Natalie. Karina, I can see you nodding. Can I put you on the spot first up? Look, I love that question, Natalie. And I think um, it speaks to the action. So what next? You're like, what's working? And, and how do we get some of these NGOs, such as the Benevolent Society, working alongside health and education? And I do feel like sometimes with the introduction of the NDIA for little ones with a disability, that some of the really great work that was done towards integration, we, we, we almost made a backward step. Some, you know, each of those um, areas sort of stepped back into their silos just to see what would happen. And I guess, um, Natalie, we need to step back out of those silos and work together again. You know, like you said, we're all here for the same purposes. It's really lovely to see some of those integrated settings happening. I know that the early year centres in um, Queensland, where we have health working alongside education, working alongside um, early childhood, early intervention, for example. I guess hubs is a really great way and that's where I have seen it work before. It's lovely. Um, Cairns is one of the um, early year centres here in Queensland and we actually have health infrastructure inside an NGO building. So, you know, the, the Queensland health nurses are able to actually access all of their computers and all of their documents and everything they need to be able to do their work from an NGO setting. So I think more of that and being able to think outside of the box and not be contained by some of the um, imposed structures like IT and information sharing and you know really being able to talk to families about how we do that so that it doesn't become something that is fearful. I know a lot of families feel like, oh, if health is going to share my information with an NGO, um, what does that mean? So, so being able to be really clear about how we share information and how we work alongside families together um, rather than jumping through different silos for different types of support. 
I think it does need to start with the conversation. We, we do work quite closely with health in the Brisbane area and it did. It started with that conversation. You know, lots of families are having to go to Queensland Health for the diagnostic service, say, for a child with a disability, but then they need to come to the ECEI to actually have that functional side of things um, w looked at. So, so it's almost like children are on two pathways at the same time. So um, the CABS team, so the uh, child health referral team at Queensland Health and the early childhood early intervention team at Benevolent Society sat down and said, well, how can we work these referral pathways so that for families, it just feels like no wrong door, that they're coming through, we're working alongside them while they're going down those both of those pathways. So I think more of that, more being able to work out where our intersection points are. I think a lot changed when NDIA came in, but we need to come back together and have those conversations about firstly, where are the intersection points and how can we um, bridge some of those gaps so that you know the families and children that we're working with aren't having to jump through a different box for health, for education, for NDIA, for, for mm. school, for all of the different things that are happening in their lives. Uh, would any other panellists like to add to Karina's comments? Only to the point it will drag us down into the cynicism, unfortunately. Um, so my child turns 10 this year and unfortunately I have always been the bridge between the different systems. Um, now I can only speak to a Metro Brisbane um, experience so I don't know whether that absence of any connections is because of proximity. Um, or the assumption that, um, you know, as a family, we could advocate for ourselves. But um, I almost breathed a sigh of relief um, when we, when Eliza went to school, because I knew for at least seven years I was in the education system and, and that was probably my day-to-day -day place that I needed to work the hardest on, on navigating. Um, I, certainly in those early years, um, you know, going across, um, you know, what was then disability services, um, health and then, you know, navigating into the NDIS was, was, you know, one of the biggest challenges of my adulting life. Um, lots of opportunity to be an adult and be a reasonable person. Um, and I cannot even begin to imagine how much harder that would be if English was not my first language, um, if I didn't have the support um, of my family and also we had had a child beforehand and you know had managed to keep him in reasonable good reasonably good condition before Eliza came along so you know we kind of like you get the puppy first and then you get the child and you manage to, to work it out um, so I think um, navigating those systems um, in the early years when there are so many unknowns in your child's life as well is a complexity. Um, I talk about um, skill set and mindset. So having the skills to advocate for your child, but also the mindset and being able to approach the people in front of you and working out what they need from you to help your child. And that is a, that is a continual um, challenge and then to be there for your child and what they need from you as well. So I suppose asking people not to underestimate the challenges that presents for families. Um, so to hear um, Tasha and Sarah talk about, um, you know, the support that they've provided to that grandmother, for example, um, and being able to have those conversations is fantastic. Um, and, you know, more funding to replicate those sorts of services across a range of places um, in Australia would be would be brilliant. Great. So thanks, Tasha and uh, Sarah. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just think um, what Sue's just saying, you know, by the work that Sarah and I've done, it is so important. And that's where the Benevolent Society does recognise the work, you know, that the community controlled organisations, I can't speak, can, organisations are, are doing and, and it should be done by them. It should be led by them. So why not, you know, have this partnership where we can connect and work together and have those um, culturally safe pathways but that work is still, you know, it's led by by the, the leaders in, in, you know, with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, and I guess the same needs to happen in our called communities, you know, um, in other areas. Yeah, 100%. Um, 
Right. It works. Yeah, no, you've, you're a good example of that. And uh, it's been great to hear more about your work. Um, we're getting closer to the sort of uh, latter stage of our session. So I just wanted each of you as panelists to think about what's your final message? Like every child is an advocacy coalition. So, you know, have you got thoughts on, on what uh, actions need to be taken up collectively by all of us. So have a think about that and I'll come back to you. And I can see Maddie's, um, uh, Ma Madison Hetty's been online, smiling away and nodding. Um, if you'd like to, Maddie, in five or 10 minutes, you're most welcome to give your final little wrap up as well. So I'll just park that thought with you and offer that opportunity. And you let us know in the, uh, if you want to take that up. Uh, Sue Tate will be wrapping up with some actions around the national wellbeing commitment. Uh, and we're really keen for people to share their stories. So our website will have a link where people can share those stories and we'd encourage you to use that opportunity because that obviously helps in practice informed advocacy. Advocacy is driven by evidence, but it's also driven by all this practice wisdom that you're all bringing uh, to the session today. So in getting closer to the, the last sort of wrap up session, uh, can I ask you to think about, you know, what are some actions? What are things we need to think about? What do we need to do? You've got a collective group of people on this session who are linked to many other networks. Uh, so, you know, what sorts of things would you like to leave us with? What sorts of tips and actions? Um, Again, I'll open to whoever has that fresh in their head. I Probably Karina, she's been on a soapbox today and I'm sure she's on a soapbox about advocacy. Karina, did you want to kick us off in this last bit of the session? I was busy over in the chat section reading the um, questions and the comments <laughs> over there. So yes, I certainly can. I'm sorry. Um, okay. and, and hi, Beth, I can see you're there as well. Look, I think the call to action is exactly what we've been talking about that you know what do we need to do this like this is an advocacy campaign this is trying to move us into a space where we are where we have communities that are ready for our children where we are wrapping those six elements around our little ones and yes we are at that conversation stage we need to move it to the action stage i love that it's Reconciliation Week this weekend is all about. It's more than a word, it takes action. This applies directly here as well. We need to start taking some actions um, and moving beyond the conversation to, okay, so where do we intersect? How can we wrap around supports for families better? Um, Sue's point that families are the first advocate for their children, I think really recognising that as well and empowering our families to be able to be advocates. There's a lot of um, sort of space to talk about that and and grow that in the space we're talking about now as well, because, you know, nobody's born an advocate, nobody's born knowing how to go into the schools and have those tough conversations or going out in the community and having those. And yes, each of us in this space need to be able to do that. But we also need to be empowering our parents and the families of, you know, the children that we're working with to be able to be that first advocate, to be able to be strong in that voice and know that somebody is standing behind them and saying, yes, you know, this is your right. This is, you know, how we go about having these conversations um, because without that, um, it is really challenging, you know, as children grow, there are different people who will dip in and out of their lives as those support networks, but it is families, it is parents, it is those people, you know, who are caring for the children in that very, very early stage and throughout their lives that will be there and will continue to be that advocate and it comes it comes at a cost for a lot of our families and parents so mm. recognizing that and really supporting that as a community as well good thanks Karina um Tasha or Sarah did you want to add to that because Sue gets her opportunity right at the end she has the last last word today yeah, I was just going to say that like one of the, the six communication strategies is, you know, that positive identity and culture. Um, I think, you know, we all need to continue to work alongside each other to have these positive outcomes for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Um, you know, I always say, you know, it is about working alongside each other. It's not about one person in the lead and one person following behind. It's about us doing it together. 
Um, and I think the partnership has proven that, that this work can happen um, and we can, you know, reduce some of those barriers and, and so better support our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. So to me, that's a really important, I love that you have that communication strategy in your um, It Takes Six, um, because it is really important and a lot of our children aren't connected to their identity and their culture. Mm, no, that's great. Um, I think Maddie uh, from WA, way across the country there, does want to have her last word as well. Maddie, are you ready to go? What's your final say, particularly thinking about what next, what action should we take? Mm. Yeah, I... I think, as everyone said, we need to, like, remember that, well, especially for me, my family had no idea of even what disability was. When I was born, um, so disability advocates and the work all you guys are doing is fantastic and advocacy has come so far but now we need to start expanding and really taking those actions because every individual is different and every family needs help just like we do. So if we can provide access to support and information to these families, that will ensure that those individuals can get the right support that they need to grow up to be a well-rounded human being and develop all those six cogs that they really need. That's great. In fact, you've mentioned those six cogs. It takes six. I'm just going to cut to that slide again and just remind everyone that uh, this is simply a communication tool. The more detailed information about the evidence behind all these areas and strategies, uh, a RACI, their nest, is a really enduring evidence-based resource. And I refer you again to their website for more information. Uh, but every child will be working on communications tools to cut through the jargon of public health models, ecological models, and really try and get people understanding this idea of it takes six. It's, um, I guess, akin to the five food groups. You can't remember six elements. I know that it's pretty hard, but we're trying to get people to get, you know, front of mind this idea that we've got to work better together. Uh, as a former housing minister, I'm so passionate about the role of housing, but sometimes people don't see housing as the foundation that they should. And certainly the call for more affordable and social housing is something that every child actively supports. And we're backing the Everybody's Home campaign and National Shelter and others. So just lock those cogs into your minds. Keep talking about them to others. Refer people to the NEST and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Studies, their ecological model, the um, Building Blocks of Family Matters campaign. They're all evidence-based uh, frameworks, tools, whatever you want to call them. But it'd be great if we can start getting people really understanding that it does take six, it takes all these elements. Um, we've, we're going to cut now to Sue. We're getting close to the end of our program. Uh, Sue, as a steering committee member of Every Child, that's the leadership group of Every Child. Uh, I don't think she asked for the last say, but in <coughs> honour of Sue and all the great work Sider do, we're going to give her the last word and ask her to really focus in on what next, what actions, and talk to the wellbeing commitment as well. 
So wrap it up for us. Sure, and, I, and I'll start by saying thank you very much to all our speakers and panel members today um, for their openness and um, sharing their experience and also their, their hopes for the future. I suppose I'd like to concentrate on the final cog that you see on the image, which is participating and having a say. Um, and children and young people with disability, they are, deserve and are entitled to participate in all aspects of life on an equal basis. And in many areas, this is currently not happening. Um, and it is largely because of the attitudes and the barriers constructed by others. Now, these are harsh words in such a positive event, um, but young people really value role models that present the options that they have in life and help pave the way for different pathways that might um, not normally be open to them. So CIDA, so Children and Young People with Disability Australia, we value the importance of creating creating those opportunities for young people to come together, to share their ideas and to learn and grow. So I think the challenge I would put out there for non-government organisations, government organisations, individual practitioners, is to use the It Takes Six communication tool to think about your own work and your own organisation and how you are communicating with young people and young people with disability and how you are engaging them in your organisations and in your work. Um, there is a lot more that all of us could do to look at the content that we share, the events that we run, and young people are hungry to hold positions of real power and to be able to enact change for the betterment of themselves and their own community as well. So I would challenge you to think about how young people and how young people with disability in particular can have a voice and be part of improving the systems that you are part of. Um, it is surprising how strong the memories are for young people of their schooling and their early childhood experience. You know, as a 47 year old woman, I know it's very distant and fuzzy, um, but young people have real insight into their experiences. So please, I encourage you to use the It Takes Six communication tool as part of inviting young people and young people with disability in particular into your organisation. And thank you very much for the many challenging and open questions. Um, I think the more that we talk about the issues and the possible solutions and hear from people like Tasha and Sarah as to the work that they're doing and obviously Karina as well. It's gonna help inspire others. Um, and obviously Maddie, you know, the work that she does in sharing her story, very much appreciate. Um, so I would encourage you to check out the National Child and Youth Wellbeing Commitment, check out the Every Child website, check out the Thrive by Five, website and thank you very much to the support from Thrive by Five and also the Benevolent Society for helping us with this um, conversation today but also their ongoing commitment. So please I encourage you to sign the petition. It's the National Child and Youth Wellbeing Commitment. I can't think of anybody who wouldn't want to support such a thing but what's important is to have a look at It Takes Six and how you can bring that into your daily practice and thank you everybody for being part of today. You're still on silent Karen. <laughs> Lucky I've got you around to guide me haven't I? <laughs> Thanks. Um, Sue, we love having CIDA on the Every Child Steering Committee and thank you for your input today and those words of rallying us there to, to the cause and to join up with those campaigns. Together, we can be strong and we can have an impact. Uh, to all of our panellists today, you've done a great job, haven't you? <laughs> Fantastic job. So thank you to Karina and Maddie, Tasha and Sarah, uh, Jay, um, to the team uh, at Essential Media, my colleague Freya Whitehead, who's pulled a lot of this together. Good on you all. Uh, we've had a great discussion, so please put some feedback in the chat box uh, on what we can do next. Put some feedback in there on how you found the pre presentations. Um, and look, I guess, you know, the final word really is uh, there's a lot we can be doing together. We're better together. We're stronger together. Uh, you know, and there's great examples we've heard today of where, uh, you know, our service providers in local areas, in regional areas are getting together and doing some really great stuff. So thank you all. 
been a great session. Uh, jump on board, jump on the Every Child website, get to the Erasey website, go to all those other websites <laughs> and make sure you do some actions today. I, I, I asked you to commit to a couple of actions when you jump offline today. Thank you all so much.